I'm betting that many of you have used the OEM diagnostic flowchart as part of your troubleshooting process. But what happens when you get to that last line that says, replace the ECM? Well, before you pull the trigger and replace a very expensive component, you may want to watch this episode of The Trainer. Today's episode is brought to you by Autel. Be sure to check out their entire line of diagnostic tools at www.autel.com. The Engine Control Module, or ECM, is the computer that manages every system on the vehicle related to emissions. When something goes wrong, the ECM will hopefully record a diagnostic trouble code and turn on the check engine light. But an ECM can't do anything until it's been told what to do. That is programmed. These are the instructions that the engineers provide to the ECM so it can carry out its primary tasks, and that's to maintain vehicle emissions. Now, in order to carry out this job, the ECM is in charge of several subsystems, the ignition, fuel injection, EVAP, and others and it needs information so it knows what's going on with each of them, information provided by a variety of sensors. The crank and cam sensors for engine position, the mass airflow sensor for the amount of air being taken in, and numerous other sensors on the vehicle that I'm sure you're already pretty familiar with. Once the ECM has this information, it plugs it into the parameters set by the software engineers who programmed it to determine what action or actions it needs to carry out. Now these actions are typically carried out by the ECM's controlling of a variety of circuits using either a low side or high side driver. Drivers are nothing more than an internal switch in the ECM that turns the circuits on and off. A low side driver completes the ground path of the circuit that it's controlling, while the high side driver completes the power supply side of the circuit. The ECM has no way of knowing whether this action that it ordered was completed or not, so it has to rely on some type of feedback strategy to let it know that it did indeed happen. Sometimes that feedback can be supplied directly by a sensor, the oxygen sensor, for example. In other cases, the ECM will monitor another system to see if a change occurred that was expected that corresponds with the action it took in the primary system. Now granted, this is all a little simplistic, but what I want you to take away from all of this is that there are several things we need to verify before we condemn the ECM. We first have to make sure that the sensor data is indeed making it to the ECM and that the information the sensors are sending is accurate. The ECM can only act on the information it receives and it may not be able to tell whether or not that sensor is lying to it or not. One way that you can see if the information is being received by the ECM is to look at the data parameter identifiers, that is the data PIDs, that you can see on your scan tool. Now if you change the state of that sensor, do you see the change of state in the signal information being reported back to the ECM? Sometimes if you make a change of state in one system, do you see a corresponding change in another? Or can you compare one sensor to another to see if they're in agreement. These are all different ways that you can use to determine whether or not the sensor is reporting the way it should. Here's an example. The RPM PID is a direct input from the CKP or crankshaft position sensor. With the engine warm and idling, does this reading look normal or abnormal? Now I'll open and close the throttle. See how the data PID changes in response? The ECM needs consistent and accurate information to do its job. Sometimes the information coming from the sensors is not as accurate as it should be, or it's being sent less than continuously. Either one is bad, and both are something that your scan tool alone may not capture. That's where the scope function of the MS-919 comes into play. What do you say we hook up to the crankshaft position sensor signal and see what it looks like on the scope? 
The first step is to review the engine performance wiring diagram and identify the wires leading to the crankshaft position sensor. All right, so the crankshaft position sensor on this vehicle is a three wire sensor. I should expect to see a digital signal on the scope. One of the wires is power from the ECM. It's typically a five volt reference. The other is ground. And the third is the signal wire sending that crankshaft signal back to the computer. Next, we need to set up our scope to capture the signal. I like to use the 2020 rule to start. The 2020 rule means that I need to set my voltage scale to cover a 20 volt range, appropriate since most of the vehicle systems are 12 volt systems. The second 20 means that I need to set the time scale to 20 milliseconds per division. That gives me a total time on the screen of 200 milliseconds, about the amount of time it takes for the engine to complete two full revolutions. And last, I need a trigger. Let's use the Autel's automatic option and see what we get. Finally, we'll start the engine and capture the signal pattern. You can use the time and voltage divisions like a zoom control so that you get a clearer pattern. The pattern should be clean and repetitive with no fallouts. It should also reach a certain level, in this case, five volts, or the ECM is not going to see it. It's always best to compare a pattern like this one to a known good when you're doing your diagnostics. If you suspect an intermittent signal loss, you can try the picket fence technique. This is where you adjust the time scales to a higher value until the pattern looks something like this, almost a smear, but still somewhat distinguishable. Now, if a dropout occurs, you'll see it as a missing picket in your picket fence. Now, there are three basic types of sensor signals that you may capture with your scope. One is the digital signal like you saw here, the other is the AC signal, which is similar to a sine wave in appearance. And the third is a varying voltage signal, like those produced by the throttle position sensor, for example. It's always helpful to compare these to a known good pattern when you're working on your diagnosis. And many of these resources are available in the tool and online. So the next step in our troubleshooting is to see whether or not the ECM can issue its command and control the actuated component and to see if the component responds to the command. The easiest way to do that is to use the bi-directional controls in your scan tool. Either monitor the data PID or actually go by visual or audible check, issue the command with the scan tool and see if it was carried out. As in the case of the fuel injector test that I'm about to do, I'm going to be listening for the click as the injectors are commanded to open and close. The scan tool can only tell us so much, so if I want to find out more about how well that component is working, I'm going to use my scope next. Now this is a gasoline direct injection or GDI system. It uses an electromechanical fuel injector powered by two wires, one ground or the actuating side and one power supply. Now you, here's a word of caution for you. When you're connecting something to your scope that you've never connected before, make sure you do your homework. In the case of this style of injector, a peak voltage of 65 volts is initially applied to get the injector to open. In some older scopes, that's beyond the threshold voltage that it can take. And in that case, hooking up to this vehicle with that scope would cause damage to the scope. Most modern scopes though, have a much higher threshold level. In any case, if you're not sure, then use a device called an attenuator. This is something that goes in line with your scope lead and it filters the incoming voltage down in either a 10 to one or 20 to one ratio. We'll start by setting up our scope using the same 2020 rule that we did earlier. I'm going to connect one channel of the scope to the ground or control side of one of the fuel injectors. Now keep something in mind, we're starting off with that 2020 rule as I mentioned, but the injectors on a GDI engine, they fire at an extremely fast rate. 
and are only open for a little more than a millisecond. We're definitely going to have to adjust the time divisions to really see what this pattern looks like. I'm going to also introduce something new to you. It's called the Low Amp Probe, and it's designed for use with either your DVOM, or in this case, the lab scope. This is going to allow me to see the current and the variations in that current as the injector is operated. Now, if you're familiar with Ohm's law, you know that current can be impacted by changes in resistance or changes in voltage. So if this pattern is not as it should be, and that's letting me know that something electrically is not quite right. With everything ready to go, let's start the vehicle up and capture our pattern. When reviewing this pattern, you must keep in mind that on a GDI engine, we have a very short amount of time to get that fuel charge into the combustion chamber. In this case, you can see the 65 volt peak that I mentioned earlier. This is needed to create a magnetic field in the windings in the injector very quickly and strong enough to open the pintle against the pressure of the fuel in the fuel rail. Once we have it open though, we can now pulse width modulate it, that is, open it and close it numerous times at a much lower level, which is what you see at the end of this pattern. But note that even with all this activity, from start to finish, it's only taking a little more than one millisecond. That's less time than it takes for a spark to jump across the spark plug gap. Now let's consider that current pattern a little more closely. If you saw an injector with a current ramp that was lower than the others, what would you expect there to be wrong in that circuit? What would you look for? Well, of course, a decrease in current means an increase in resistance. And that's why we'd be troubleshooting the circuit. Anything that might cause an extra source of resistance that's not supposed to be there. Often these sources of extra resistance can be something as simple as corrosion in the wiring connectors themselves. You can expect for this very easily by using the camera on your phone to take a photograph of the connectors, both male and female side, and then blowing them up. That'll really help you do a visual inspection. If you do see any signs of corrosion or damage, use some electrical contact cleaner to clean it off and then I like to use a product called Stablent 22 to further enhance the connectivity. Stablent 22 is initially non-conductive. It's a block polymer that when used in a thin film switches to a conductive state under the effect of the electrical field. It remains non-conductive between adjacent contacts and can provide the connection reliability of a soldered joint without permanently bonding the contact surfaces together. Conversely, if the current ramp is much higher than the others, well, that indicates a low resistance. And the first step that I would take would be to inspect the static resistance measurements of all the injectors on the vehicle. There too, the MS919 can be of help using its built-in multimeter function. If the injector is shorted internally, well, that's gonna cause that higher current demand, and it can also lead to damage to the driver in the ECM. In fact, this is not an uncommon cause. So if you're replacing an ECM, one of the steps that you must take before installing the new one is to check all the actuator controlled circuits for proper operation and proper current demand. And if there is no injector operation, that there's no current, there's no voltage change, then you need to inspect it like you would any other electrical circuit. And that all starts by reviewing the wiring diagram so that you can make yourself familiar with how the circuit is supposed to operate. The ECM, and for that matter, all the ECUs on the vehicle, are the most expensive fuses on the car. If you're going to replace one or you suspect one has failed, you first need to do three things. Number one, make sure that the information the ECM needs is getting there. Number two, 
make sure the programming is current and correct. And number three, make sure the ECM is able to carry out its commands to the various actuators it's in charge of. Now, if you are replacing a failed ECM, you'll also wanna check all of the actuator circuits to make sure they are operating as designed. For example, if one has shorted and causing a higher current demand, that could ultimately be in the cause of that ECU's failure. Now, if you wanna know more about any of the tools that I've showed you today, by all means, visit our sponsor, www.autel.com. And as always, thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.